Stealthing your way through many Paramount events in history, Assassin's Creed depicts the hidden war between the Assassins, who wish to spread knowledge and freedom, and the Templars, who wish to seize control upon humanity to instill lasting world peace. Since 2007, Assassin's Creed has captivated many, with its dazzling story intertwining real-life figures and events through the use of the virtual reality machine, the Animus, allowing the modern world to see past events that have been skewed throughout time, projecting the true events in a digital virtual world. The overwhelming success of the original Assassin's Creed game has led to over a dozen games being released, with games like Mirage still yet to come. Many novels have also been written, comics have been issued, and even a feature film has been adapted due to the overwhelming success of Assassin's Creed. Part of what makes Assassin's Creed so alluring is the many secrets being unmasked during our adventure, both in the digital reality and the evolved physical world. Abstergo Industries, the modern depiction of the Templars, is one of the largest companies in the world, and still ever present in their battle with the Assassins, racing through memories of their ancestors to locate powerful artifacts known as the Apples of Eden in order to control or guide the world. Many secrets in Assassin's Creed are very complex to both understand and discover, while there are still some that are yet to be solved. An iceberg chart is a way of presenting these mysteries, theories and little known facts, ordering them so the more popular theories are located at the top of the iceberg, and as you travel deeper below the iceberg, the more obscure, mind-boggling, and perhaps even outlandish the mysteries become. Today we'll be attempting to sink our teeth into a complete Assassin's Creed iceberg, covering many aspects of the franchise. We'll actually be discussing my favourite points from three icebergs that can be found on the internet. The earliest iceberg under our gaze today is one created by Dude Soul back in 2020. And the second iceberg that we're examining is Bruno HM's Iceberg of Mysteries. This definitely had the name that caught my attention. And the final iceberg we'll be including today is the largest, created by I'm Hosen 1, containing a massive 10 layers. Now before you get too excited, we won't be covering every single point here in this iceberg. It'll be the ones that I find the most intriguing, and I'll present them as amalgamation of all the icebergs. Before we start our descent, there is one important aspect of Assassin's Creed that I'd like to mention, and that's retroactive continuity. Retconning is when previous events are given a different perspective, through new information being provided. Previous information that was once deemed as true is contradicted, allowing new creative avenues to be explored. Assassin's Creed, unfortunately for our sake, is no stranger to retcons. One of the most notable examples of this is the explanation of the Assassin's history. In the original Assassin's Creed, Lucy Stillman explains the origins of the Assassins in the Temple War. That little fight your ancestors started during the Third Crusade, it never ended. The Third Crusade was during the years 1189 and 1192. Assassin's Creed was originally supposed to be the next Prince of Persia game, titled Prince of Persia Assassins. Planned to be a sequel for the next generation consoles, the mandate was to redefine the action-adventure genre. Director Patrice Desolet stated that it was difficult to incorporate a prince into the game. A prince is not an action character per se. He's somebody who waits for a mummy or daddy to die to take their place. He's the number two of an organisation. So I switched the organisation from a kingdom to an assassin brotherhood. So if you're the number two, you're the assassin of the prince. And since the assassins were in Persia, roughly put, that would be the prince of Persia. That's how the whole concept of Assassin's Creed started. So the design of Assassin's Creed evolved, but still maintained its roots to the Prince of Persia. It was heavily inspired by the Persian book Alamut, written by Vladimir Bartol. This book described the historical order of the Assassins. Living in the mountains of Persia and Syria around the 12th century, they assassinated Muslim and Christian leaders who were considered enemies of the state. The way the order killed these leaders is believed to be where the term assassination stems from. The original Assassin's Creed remained relatively true to these inspired historical roots, with Desolée even stating that Altair is the Prince of Persia. But once we get to Assassin's Creed 2, we can uncover six hidden tombs, built by members of the Italian Brotherhood. These tombs were dedicated to six of the first Assassins. Leonius, who assassinated Caligula. Iltony, who assassinated Alexander the Great. Aminet, who assassinated Cleopatra. Wei Yu, who assassinated Qing Shi Huang. Darius, who assassinated Xerxes I, and Kulangal, who assassinated Genghis Khan. Many of these assassinations occurred before the Persians' 11th century origins. So it seems like the assassin's history has been retconned. 
However, Max Speed Go 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 explains that the assassin's history could be interpreted as all of the proto-assassins tracing their roots through to Altair, the true spreader of the assassin's order. Altair's personal journal, his codex, states that he believes that we, the assassins, have simply rediscovered an order that predates the old man himself. The Abstergo files and revelations state that officially, the Order of the Knights Templar was created in 1129, but we have endured, under various appellations, since well before the 12th century. We were there when Cleopatra claimed her birthright, when Alexander the Great forged his empire, and when Xerxes sent his armies to crush the Greeks. Like the Order of the Knights Templar, the Assassins became public during the Middle Ages. Also, like us, the Brotherhood has existed under one form or another, since perhaps the dawn of humanity, and their operations span the entire globe. So technically we could argue that no retcon has actually happened here, but what we should take as a lesson from this is that even now, we might not know the full picture to many of these theories, and in the present, we could be misled, with chapters still unwritten changing the story. This means the theories and the facts that we state in this iceberg could in turn become completely false, remain a mystery, or perhaps reveal itself to be the truth. But the more mature the Assassin's Creed story becomes, the less retcons should be taking place. So perhaps we are safer now than what we would be a decade ago. So we've kind of cheated and talked about a couple of points in this iceberg, but we can say the sky layer was just to equip ourselves. And now I think we're finally ready to take the leap of faith down below into the depths of the Assassin's Creed iceberg. Giant Squid The Assassin's Creed games, especially Valhalla, are full of mythology and hidden easter eggs, and one of the most ominous easter eggs is that of a giant squid. In Assassin's Creed 2, Ezio can see a giant squid while underground in the Assassin's tombs, located in Santa Maria. And in Black Flag, Edward Kenway can witness a giant squid consuming an entire white whale. It's peculiar that something as prominent as a giant squid would appear in the Assassin's Creed universe multiple times each time as a hidden easter egg. The presence of a giant squid makes more sense in Black Flag, with many pirates telling stories of a large monster, the Kraken, hunting the sea and harassing vessels. Danish author Eric Pendopadan popularised the term Kraken in 1753, only slightly after the events of Black Flag, and he described the Kraken as a giant sea crab or an octopus. But for a squid to appear in the tomb, that seems a bit out of place. It's most likely a reference to HP Lovecraft, with the Kraken being a great old one. Assassin's Creed is no stranger to Lovecraft references, with Syndicate containing the great old one's caress, a set of brass knuckles containing small knobs along its outside to resemble a tentacle. Perhaps the sage will be able to one day reveal the full extent of the Lovecraft's influence. A sage, first mentioned in Black Flag, is an extraordinary human being a representation of Aeta, an Isu scientist and a husband of Juno. The Isu were the first civilization, those that came before and created humanity. Aeta transferred his consciousness into an artificial body in an attempt to save the Isu from the foretold destruction of the world. But this experiment failed, with Aeta's mind becoming brittle, and him becoming a prisoner of his own body. In an attempt to save him, Juno, along with Odin, acquired the need of poetry creating a serum that was used to embed her husband into the human bloodline. This mead serum would randomly activate and alter the genetic makeup of an individual, changing their appearance and flooding them with memories of Aeta, marking them as a sage. This was often very traumatic for the human host, with many sages succumbing to madness as their own memories and life were slowly consumed by those of Aeta. Originally, many assumed that because sages were essentially a reborn Aeta, there was only destined to be one sage alive at any point in time. But as we now know, this is not the case. Multiple sages can often be alive at once. The pirate Bartholomew Romitz was a sage who was constantly chased by the Templars. I was born with memories of this place. Memories of another time entirely, I think. Like, a, like another life I've already led. But also alive at the same time was Thomas K. R. Jr., who was also a sage writing many letters regarding his condition. 
Infernox Ratchet suggests that rather than sages being reincarnations of Aita, the sages are just inheriting the genetic memory that have been activated within themselves. This could be viewed as being similar to the bleeding effect that many get while using the Animus. It's worth noting that some sages like Thomas seem to be able to resist the allure of Aita, while others like Bartholomew appear to be completely consumed by him. And these two are the only sages mentioned throughout Assassin's Creed. Some notable sages include Elijah, Desmond Miles' son, whose life is explored in the comics, and one particular individual found in the Abstergo database entry in Unity. This entry details a list of potential sages. A man called David Jones is marked as supposedly being a sage, said to be otherworldly, extraterrestrial, and possessed by multiple personalities. This is a reference to David Robert Jones, who's more commonly known as David Bowie. David Bowie adopted many personas, with the other lines being references to his songs, like Loving the Alien, which does coincidentally mention Templars. So David Bowie could be a sage in the Assassin's Creed universe, but I don't think we'll see anything else about him other than this database entry regarding him. There's one individual that's not mentioned in this database of potential sages, but has been regarded by many to be a sage, and that's the Old Man of the Mountain, Al Mualim. Al Mualim oversaw and coordinated the actions of the Levantine Brotherhood of Assassin's Order. The Assassin's Creed infographics, which explores the amazing history of the Assassin's Creed universe, details the history of the Apples of Eden. The second apple, the Apple of Eden that was reactivated by Bayek, was in the possession of Al Mualim, who was the old sage and mentor of the assassins. Now is this a reference that Al-Mu'alim is directly a sage? Well, not convincingly. Darkspine 10 believes that this mentioning of sage is just in reference to being profoundly wise, as is written sage of the assassins, rather than the assassin's sage. Al-Mu'alim was introduced in the first Assassin's Creed, while sages were introduced in Black Flag. So you do have to ponder if the concept of a sage was to be introduced in the first Assassin's Creed, if Al Mu'alim would have turned out to be one. The infographics did state that Al Mu'alim was being a sage, with a capital S, and this would infer that they are talking about the title of sage, rather than it being a descriptor. Most sages in Assassin's Creed possess one distinctive identifying trait, heterochromia, which is primarily the colour difference in eyes, but could also be found in hair or skin. Al Mu'alim has one brown eye, with the other misty, but this is most likely just a result of his blind eye. Or perhaps it was just clouding a future that was yet uncertain. He does have the personality traits of a sage, betraying others for his own personal gain, and he wields the apple of Eden very naturally, which suggests he at least has a strong amount of Isu DNA. But that doesn't necessarily mean that he is a sage. Al Mualim does say something interesting when faced by Altier. I have stood before a thousand men, all of them superior to you, and all of them dead. By my hand! Initially, you would take a thousand men as being a brag, but perhaps it is in fact literal. If Al Mualim was a sage, perhaps the combined memory of Aita and himself actually did face a thousand men. I think that initially, Al Mualim would have not been a sage, with the concepts not mature enough until at least Assassin's Creed 3, when Aita was first introduced. But I think if Ubisoft were to look back at this era, they would more than likely categorise Al Mualim as a sage. But now, let's get our diving bells ready, as it's time for us to explore the murky depths of this iceberg. Desmond Lives Desmond Miles was the protagonist of the original saga, having initially been forced to relive memories for the modern day company of the Templar Order, Abstergo. He's later reunited with the Assassins, and learns to gain the skills of his ancestors through the bleeding of their past memories into his. But when the Isu warns Desmond of the second disaster of 2012, a catastrophic event threatening to wipe out most of humankind, Desmond then set out to locate the Isu's Grand Temple, with what was contained inside said to be able to prevent this tragedy. But the mystical device that would end up saving the world had a cost. It would also end Desmond's life. Desmond could either activate the device, saving the planet, while perishing, and in turn releasing the evil Isu of Juno, or he could refrain from activating the device. And although the world would mainly be destroyed, many humans would still survive and see Desmond as a leader, a religious figure that would rebuild the world. But upon his death, his words would cause division and war, thus repeating the cycle of human civilization. Desmond chooses to activate the device, saving the world, but not himself. 
Such an act of martyrdom didn't lose itself in the history books, at least for the players of the Assassin's Creed games. Many chose not to simply believe that Desmond was dead, even with a post-mortem report in Black Flag, detailing Desmond's dissection by Abstergo. Altair for President promoted a theory that Desmond Miles is not only alive and well, but he has also been managing to launch cyber attacks against his nemesis Abstergo. In Unity, the Assassin Intel Database 16, Chatlog, details one of the most well-coordinated attacks on the Abstergo databases. This was more widely thought to be Juno, with their consciousness managing to inhabit the equipment that was brought by Abstergo when they were collecting Desmond's body. This attack was hard to explain, it's almost as if it was two parts of a single program, one on the inside and one on the outside, just sort of joined up and come to life, so to speak. While this could certainly be Juno, Altair for President believes that this is actually Desmond's doing. The attack was described as being similar to Clay Kazmarek's case about a year ago, but possible on a far greater scale. Clay Kazmarek, the subject before Desmond, Subject 16, made an artificial construct of himself inside the Animus, with the digital form of his self living on, while his earthly self perished. Desmond, Subject 17, Clay's successor, was a much stronger version of Clay, so it could be true that Desmond, like Clay, preserved the digital version of himself, powerful enough to attack the Abstergo servers, and while physically dead, still digitally alive and constantly keeping the Templars at bay. The chat lock repeatedly mentions the number 17. I have a meeting at 1700 to learn more. 17 separate servers compromised simultaneously. 17 completely independent attacks, rather than one attack on 17 targets. The equivalent of someone playing and winning 17 separate chess games in the space of a few seconds. 17 was mentioned 5 times, the same number of games that Desmond was playable in. 1, 2, Brotherhood, Revelations and 3. Talk to me like I'm 5. During this attack, the individual responsible for this didn't take anything. The Templar Order thought they were taking or looking for something, but perhaps this wasn't this attack's intention. Maybe this attack was leaving something, leaving a message. These numbers could have been subtle clues that Desmond Miles is in fact still alive and well inside the digital world. Fast forwarding to the events of Valhalla, it's been revealed that Desmond is indeed still alive, having spent 8 years inside the grave, the digital afterlife, taking the mantle of the reader, one reading all the possible future timelines to yet again try and save humanity. Although it's not specifically mentioned in the game that the reader is Desmond Miles, it's safe to presume that this is Desmond, as they're both voiced by the same voice actor. Nolan North. So the theory that Desmond is alive has all but been confirmed to be true. So were these chat logs, left in unity, a subtle hint as to what was to come? Or was it evidence of Desmond finally making his way to the grave? While Desmond is still very much present in the Animus, the same can't confidently be said about Clay. In Assassin's Creed Revelations, Desmond encounters Clay in the Animus Islands. And Clay helps Desmond escape, but consequently had his digital self deleted. What is a man but the sum of his memories? What are you doing? I'm saving you, idiot! While this could be interpreted at face value, that Clay was saving Desmond's life, perhaps like Emsico believes, it was Clay who in fact saved Desmond's memory into the Animus. I'm saving, you idiot. And before we saw Clay and his sacrifice in Assassin's Creed Revelations, there were only minimal hints that Clay was still alive. In Brotherhood, the Animus simulation began to fracture, with breaks in the programming of the genetic memories beginning to appear. Known as Rifts, these were puzzles concealed by Clay containing information that he found about the history of Abstergo and the Templars. Upon finding and solving the concealed puzzles held within, an achievement is given, with its name in Morse code, I am alive, with the icon for this achievement also in Morse code, revealing the number 16. Subject 16, Clay, seems to be sending us a message that he is also still alive. In retrospect, this could be the subtle nod towards Clay's digital preservation, with his introduction on the Animus Island, and later death happening in the next game, Revelations. But the trailer for Revelation might have a different answer. In this trailer, there were many hidden messages, with a computer containing messages coming from Source 16. Subject 16, holding a message that can be decoded from Base64 format, saying, I am not alive. 0808 2012. The 8th of August 2012 was the day that physical Clay died, with his digital self lasting much longer. 
So maybe the I am alive message was actually hinting at Clay still being physically alive too. And maybe this was originally planned, with perhaps them thinking that Clay would be able to re-enter the physical world, before changing their minds with the story of Revelations. Watchdog Shared Universe Like the Assassin's Creed series, Watchdogs is developed by Ubisoft. In a modern world, highly advanced hackers use their skills for both good and bad, manipulating the technologically dependent society around them. One of the missions in the first Watch Dogs tasks Aiden Pierce to take out the CEO of Abstergo Entertainment, Olivier Garneau. Tata requiesce gutsum pace, meaning rest in peace. This phrase was commonly used by Ezio. Requiescat in pace. Jumping over to the world of Assassin's Creed, Black Flag mentions that Olivier Garneau left for a shareholders meeting in Chicago, but never arrived. And if we go snooping around some personal files lying on computers around Abstergo Entertainment, we can find a file having been sent to Garno by watchdog security company Bloom, advertising their communications and security products. Very subtle clues so far, but during the events of Origins, things become much clearer. CCTV footage was contained of a hitman assassinating Olivier Garno, who does seem to have a strange resemblance to our original watchdog's protagonist. While still not definitively mentioned, it seems inevitable that these two events are linked, and many ponder as to whether Watch Dogs and Assassin's Creed indeed do exist in the same universe. And although many of these do in fact believe this to be the case, head of Assassin's Creed content Amar Azazia has squashed this theory from existence, stating that there is no multiverse. Assassin's Creed and Watch Dogs are not part of a joint narrative, they are nothing more than an easter egg. But I'm sure like many of you, I always like to have an in-game explanation for why these easter eggs could have occurred. Technically other Ubisoft titles such as Far Cry and Assassin's Creed are considered games in the Watch Dogs universe. So potentially the same could be said for Watch Dogs and Assassin's Creed. It's just a video game. With this Ocean King suggests that the person who killed Olivier could have just been a huge fan of the Watch Dogs games. Perhaps even an obsessive one. So much so that he followed the murdering of a CEO with the same methods that his video game idols would have done. Now let's ourselves enter this digital universe and explore the unknown digital afterlife of the grey. Reality is a simulation. One of the more common theories constantly prodding the minds of many Assassin's Creed players is one very reminiscent of the Matrix. While many individuals use the Animus to create a virtual reality, a simulation of what once was, a hidden question has always remained unanswered. Could the real world the world outside of the Animus also be a simulation, with the modern day just being another layer of the simulation sandwich. These thoughts have only gotten louder with Origins and Odyssey. The Isu have also long pondered these questions. An Isu known as Aletheia would run simulations, so much so that they ended up questioning their own reality. How real is the ground you walk on? How real is the machine you toy with, the music you hear, the lover you kiss, or the foe you hate? Your foot taps the ground. Does that make it real? Your enemies bleed deep red. Does that make them real? The confusion growing within you due to my words. Does it make you real? What if reality wasn't what you thought it was? But if this was all a construction, a masterfully crafted simulation, you know such things exist. You've been in the Animus before. In fact, aren't you in one right now? You know just how real a simulation can feel even when it has long vanished. You've experienced the bleeding effect. Layers upon layers of reality each blurring into the next. Which is real and which is not? What if none are real? What if everything you know is false? Juno, an Isu scientist, revealed to Desmond that the Isu made the humans inferior to the Isu, having one sense less. You with five senses, us with six. The one we kept from you, to be safe. Now you can never know. Only try. The Isu kept the sixth sense to themselves, something to use to remain dominant over the humans. Known as knowledge, the sixth sense lies dormant within human beings due to the interbreeding between the early humans and the Isu. If awakened, this sense can be used, known as eagle vision. 
Spark Synapse distinctly suggests that the eagle vision is just a fragment of the sixth sense, only able to give assassins hyper-awareness of their present or very close events in the past and the future. This is how assassins can sense an enemy through a wall, or realise that they have ill intent. But this is just a sliver of the Isu's power, a strength that we do not know the full extent of yet. Drake Rome extends this and thinks that more specifically than knowledge, the sixth sense is reading the code, and realising that we are in a simulation. In this theory, the Isu are proposed to have discovered the entire world we live in is a simulation, but they were utterly helpless in escaping. Through many attempts, they used Desmond to try and break the simulation source code and save the Earth, and then later used Layla to try and break the code to craft the utopia for both humans and themselves. The universe being a simulation could help explain how the Animus worked with DNA, with instead of the DNA holding memories of the past, it in fact code, being refactored over generations while still containing the legacy of its past. When we see both Desmond and Layla in the supposed real world, when they are close to death, we see the same screen tearing distortion effect as to those inside of the simulation. And if we delve into the uprising comics, Charlotte Dela Cruz is constantly surrounded with the idea that nothing is real, with Charlotte herself left questioning whether her life could just be a simulation from someone generations in her future. The Grey, a virtual existence in some kind of spiritual tech hybrid afterlife, contains digital remains of those who have fallen, and a simulation would explain this well, as it's just shifting the code. But I'm not really that keen on the simulation theory. If the modern reality was indeed the simulation, then it would suggest that there's some greater force than the Isu and the humans at play, using the universe as we know it as their own playground. And not only do I feel like this trope has been overused in many different stories before, I feel like it would cheapen a lot of the experiences that we have in Assassin's Creed. All the choices that we've had to make throughout the game would, in the end, be pointless, as the simulation could just be reset. So I don't think and hope that this theory is going to be true. Or perhaps it's just a sick inside joke by Ubisoft, with they themselves being the true orchestrator of all the simulations. That would be typical Ubisoft. Bayek is Desmond's ancestor. Desmond Miles was a man cultivated by the assassins, being the combination of many different lines of assassins. An email chain in Black Flag reveals that Desmond, Subject 17, has rich heritage. On his paternal side was Altair, master assassin during the Holy Crusade. Paternally, he was a descendant of Ezio, a master assassin during the Italian Renaissance. We know that Desmond is a descendant to them, as for him to access their memories through the Animus, he must be related to them with their memories stored in the DNA of their descendants. Desmond, Altair and Ezio also share the same scar, running across their lip. Desmond also has a child, with Syndicate mentioning that he unknowingly conceived a child called Elijah. We can see an older form of Elijah in the Uprising comics also bearing this same scar. It seems these scars are a visual motive to convey the relation between these individuals. Bayek was the leader of what would become the first Egyptian assassins, first appearing in Origins. Bayek's memories were relived by Layla, and by this time, the data dump scanner had been invented, which meant that accessing memories no longer needed the user to be blood related, but they could just relive any memories through an individual's genetic memory. And Layla accessed these memories through the discovery of Bayek's mummy. So there's no real proof of Bayek's ancestry here, but if we take a closer look at Bayek, we can yet again see this same scarring. Upon seeing this, many like Cirrhosis began theorising that Bayek was related to Desmond, with leaks even suggesting that Bayek was a direct ancestor of Altair. Ashraf Ismail hosted a Q&A on Twitter where he denied that Altair and Bayek were related, which you would think would put this theory to bed. But Ashraf did not actually respond to the question whether Desmond and Bayek were related. This means that Bayek could still indeed be Desmond's ancestor. Like how Ezio and Altair are not related to each other, but both ancestors of Desmond. The email chain discussing Desmond's heritage does state that in the matrilineal line from the 13th century, Desmond did have ancestors from Egypt and Northern Africa. Bayek, being from 85 BC, could have been an ancestor of this line. Although Bayek was only known to have one son, Chemu, who tragically died before he himself could have children. The Sunken Jackdaw Edward Kenway was once a farmer who sought riches and fame that his humble background could not provide. He set out to make his fortune as a privateer in the West Indies, but by 1713, the Treaty of Utrecht was signed, with major naval empires stalemating their bloody war. 
Because of this treaty, British privateers were no longer needed in the West Indies, resulting in Kenway turning to pirateering and later upon encountering the Templars, an assassin as well. The brig that Kenway captain, the Jack Daw, terrorised the Caribbean, single-handedly destroying many ships of which the Jack Daw dwarfs, Parison, as well as destroying the naval force that were scattered around the Caribbean. But during the events of Freedom Cry, the once mighty Jack Daw can be found wrecked, resting at the depths of the seas. How could such a formidable, perceivably invincible ship become just another number to the seafloor's collection? Well, there is no clear explanation in the game, which leaves a theory as to why the Jackdaw sunk up to interpretation. Fizzy believes the Jackdaw was finally bested in a naval battle, being overcome by the sheer mass of enemy ships. The sea where the Jackdaw is resting is large enough to hold a multitude of ships, but I don't think that this theory is that likely, as there are no other shipwrecks present, and you presume that the Jackdaw wouldn't have gone down without a fight. Paulo Mister valiantly hopes that perhaps this wreck we see is not the Jackdaw, but an imposter ship carrying the Jackdaw's figurehead and nameplate to strike fear into opposing ships. The Kenway Manor Inn Syndicate does still hold the wheel of the Jackdaw. So parts of the ship were either preserved at the manor or brought back to the Caribbean. But thanks to JCD, that theory is pretty much all but denied. Not content on letting the mysteries rest, JCD reached out on Twitter to the leader writer for Black Flag, Darby McDevitt, asking if it would ever be revealed as to how Jackdaw would be destroyed. McDevitt said that internally they decided that Kenway had donated it to the Brotherhood when he returned to London at the conclusion of the Black Flag. So who was on it when it sank? Maybe it was an incompetent assassin, who was easily outskilled by other ships, or maybe the ship became a victim of a deadly storm. The Jackdaw sunk sometime between 1723 and 1735, and there were many hurricanes during this time over the Atlantic, with many ships being destroyed. Perhaps the Jackdaw could have been one of them. But the theory that I like the most is one raised by Raphael N.T., who suggests that Kenway, or the assassins in charge of the ship at the time, scuttled their own ship in order to prevent it from falling into the wrong hands. And by 1735, the golden age of piracy was coming to an end. The British had vastly grown their navy and hunted down pirates with increased intensity and frequency. Many pirates were hung, or blew themselves and their ships up to the mercy of the waters to avoid capture. Perhaps this was the fate of the sunken jackdaw. Who knows, maybe a sequel to Black Flag will reveal this mystery and allow us to ride the jackdaw once again. Deeper still, where things may not be as they appear, let's finally explore the Mirage. Disappearance of Davenport Homestead Founded in 1746, the Colonial Brotherhood of the Assassins, orchestrating the American Assassin's Order, was a brotherhood whose influence grew and waned throughout history. They were most notable for Desmond Miles saving the Earth from a second global disaster, with the group then being known as the American Brotherhood of the Assassins. Achilles Davenport established his brotherhood, setting up headquarters at the Davenport Homestead. It grew to the size of a small town, being a collection of homes, farms, taverns and a church. Sometime during the Seven Years' War, the Templars attacked the homestead, greatly diminishing the strength of the assassins, with them suffering heavy casualties. Achilles remained in isolation at the homestead, with it falling into rack and ruin, until the arrival of the later dubbed Connor who helped bring the homestead to an even greater stature than its previous glory. For decades, the homestead was once again its glorious self, until sometime in the 19th century, the homestead vanished. Any manor that can suddenly vanish is both interesting and unsettling in the same measure, though probably not a great investment. If anything, the strange disappearance of Davenport Homestead deserves at least our detective mind's investment. How could basically a whole town seemingly disappear from existence, with only a faint mention of the disappearance appearing in the animus, and only the graves of the manor left to tell a tale? While the glaring answer here would simply be Ubisoft quickly smoothing over potential plot holes, it never satisfies my lore driven brain. Bruno HM thinks that perhaps the Templars revisited the homestead to destroy the assassins again, but this time they burst to the ground and destroyed every single record of it. I'll burn that homestead of yours to the ground and roast the severed heads of your precious founding fathers in its flames. Or maybe the assassins escaped and destroyed any evidence to cover their tracks. Greek Hole goes further and specifically blames Shay Cormac, a former assassin's turned Templar, 
who was shocked by the lakes of destruction, the Achilles would go in order to find pieces of Eden, inadvertently killing many innocent lives. Shane knew the location of the homestead, so perhaps him or his children, now fully indoctrinated into the Templar beliefs, could have destroyed the homestead, or posed enough of a threat to cause the assassins to demolish their manor, removing any trace of themselves and fleeing away. Assassin's Creed often mimics events that happen in real life, but there aren't any manor or colony disappearances of note in the 18th and 19th century America. But Mr. Black 24 does relate the disappearance of the Davenport homestead to the Roanoke colony, one that went missing in the 16th century. A colony established by Sir Walter Raleigh, Roanoke was aimed at being the first permanent English settlement in North America. Davenport could share a symbolic connection to the Roanoke colony, as it was also the first permanent settlement for the Brotherhood in North America. And like Davenport, Roanoke seems to have mysteriously vanished. The governor of Roanoke Colony, John White, returned to England to collect more supplies in 1587, leaving his wife, daughter, and granddaughter at the colony. However, when Wright returned to the colony in 1590, his family, along with hundreds of other inhabitants, had also vanished, with little to no trace of any of them in the now abandoned colony. For many centuries, not much was known about the outcome of the colonists, with the only clue left behind being a cryptic word, Croatoan, found carved into a wooden fence. It was initially surmised that the colonists had relocated to the nearby Croatoan island, but they either came across a hostile Native American village who massacred them, or their ships became forever lost at sea. But now, two separate research groups have found fragments of pottery and weapons, indicating that small groups of colonists have been residing peacefully around Roanoke. It's even been thought that the colony relocated inland, with hidden symbols being uncovered on the original map of the area. But what was all of this secretism for? Archaeologist Mark Horton found artifacts of both Native American and European origin in layers of dirt that appear to date back to the late 1500s coming to the conclusion that they assimilated with the Native Americans, but kept their goods. Maybe this will end up being echoed in the Assassin's Creed universe as well, potentially if Connor's story is revisited. But in truth, not much is even known about Connor after the events of Assassin's Creed 3. In Black Flag, when Abstergo recovered Desmond's body, they uploaded Connor's memory to their service. But after viewing the recordings, they chose not to make any products about him. In the Unity Handbook, it was revealed that Connor married and had children. But they later separated, with both his wife and children leaving Connor alone for the remainder of his life. Melanie LeMay, the CCO of Abstergo Entertainment, also mentions in an email found in Rogue that the events with Connor's wife and the way he died was a total mess. But the comic Assassin's Creed Reflections later reveals that this was all just propaganda pushed by Abstergo to discredit Connor, and the truth is a polar opposite. So maybe, like Jack War proposes, the Abstergo team went further than just a small dose of misinformation for Connor, and set about erasing and rewriting Connor's legacy. And removing the Davenport homestead was one small step of their plan. Why? Well, maybe that will be revealed in the future. Washington Cryptogram Throughout the Assassin's Creed franchise, there have been many puzzles and hidden messages left throughout the Animus and other materials. Most of these have been cracked, with tidbits of information being revealed to help piece together the Assassin's Creed story. But there's one coded mystery in Assassin's Creed that is still yet to be solved. George Washington's Cryptogram. Along with the deluxe version of Assassin's Creed 3, comes a notebook, resembling a diary written by George Washington. This contains many artworks, along with the details of Washington's thoughts during his Assassin's Creed life. Hidden away in this notebook are secret pages, which must be opened using a knife or a letter opener. Many of these hidden pages just detail Washington's knowledge of Connor's movement, but on some of these pages lie a coded message. The first secret page is a journal entry by Washington, detailing a method for conveying secret messages. A safe method where a coded message is written using a reference text that both the sender and the receiver of the letter have in their possession. For example, the text about Saffron is enough to decipher the coded message on the next page. This coded message is a ring containing a series of numbers, both inside and outside of the ring. Its message in entirety still remains clouded as to what it means. Adjacent to this is the Eye of Providence, which appears on a $1 bill alongside George Washington. The text about saffron is as follows. Crocus for saffron is a plant from the Orient. This bulb grows in June 
and produces a flower that quickly sprouts three elongated stigmas. The flowers are harvested by hands. Once the root has been separated and the stigma is dried, the latter are turned into a powder of great value. It allows for much freedom of use in cooking and is much in demand as a spice or colorant that can be employed in medicinal preparation. Iceberg creator and dedicated Assassin's Creed sleuther, I'm Hosen One, tried their hardest to uncover this page's mysteries, but could not fully solve it. Here is as much as we've been able to find so far. The Washington Journal was released in three languages, English, French and German. In each of these versions, the inner ring was the only ring to have changed numbers, with the other rings remaining consistent. Joseph Capelli managed to decipher the inner ring of the French version by interpreting each code to represent a word, with the first digit in the code representing the line in the page you should look at, and the latter digits representing where the word is situated on the line. Upon decryption, this inner circle revealed the message, La liberté est une plante qui croit vie une fois que la plus racine. Liberty, when it begins to take root, is a plant of rapid growth. This is a quote from George Washington himself. Going back to the English version, it seems the number 85, which is the same as the French versions, was accidentally unchanged, and its number should have been 39. If that is used, and we decipher the message with Capelli's method, the phrase, freedom is a plant that grows quickly once it has taken much root for, is discovered, which is a loose translation of the same phrase. But this method we have just used seems to decipher only the inner circle. The outer circle contains numbers that start with zero, so they instantly break our method, along with the knowledge that all three translations contain the same three outer rings. So what could the message hidden in these rings be, and how could we solve them? Many now believe that these rings are just red herrings, numbers spread to disguise the real message held within. Le Surreal eloquently puts, like the test of saffron, the root is important, and not the three stigmas held above, which could translate to the inner circle only being important. But the article states that the three elongated stigmas, the latter, are turned to a powder of great value. So maybe the three stigmas, the three outer rings, are important, with maybe the inner ring, the root, being the key to revealing what these saffrons are, where the true value of the message lies. This code is the same in all translations, so if this was actually a code, it would surely be a universally accessed key. The eye of providence on the page adjacent hasn't had any meaning yet, so maybe it's needed to be used in conjunction with this code. It could be a reference to the $1 bill, with Starship 86A proposing that the outer text could be in a language like Latin, meaning it would be the same for all books, being an external key. But I am torn as to whether this outer ring actually could be decoded. I would very much love this to be an unsolved mystery, but there are many hints that this is indeed just a red herring. The lack of difference between the translations, along with George Washington's phrasing of, this text about saffron is enough to decipher the code message, not messages, does suggest that there is indeed only one code on that page. It's time for us to desynchronize and finish our exploration of the Assassin's Creed iceberg. If you wanted to go even deeper into the Assassin's Creed lore, I suggest YouTubers such as Fitzy and Lasers, who have a massive collection of theoretical Assassin's Creed videos. Thanks for making it all the way through this video, and for delving into topics with me that were nicely categorised by Dude Soul, Bruno HM, and Imo Zen One. Let us know your opinion on all of these points, and feel free to suggest new theories in the comments. I'm always keeping an eye out. Hope to see you in the next video and throughout the Animus.